thanks again for uh, for making it, Rajesh. We're That's very, very honored to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean, the energy in this room. I had the good fortune of meeting with some of you, and I look forward to connecting with more of you later. It's great to be here. Awesome. But yeah. Rajesh, just for context, when you started Microsoft, had just gone public. This is back in 86, I think, when Microsoft went public, you yeah. joined in 1990. The stock price was roughly, I think, 60 cents, slightly lower than where it is today. Um, the company had 5,000 employees, and for the first time, had just crossed a billion dollar mark in revenues, yep. it seems. And SQL Server was released, Office for Windows was released, but if you contrast that today, Microsoft now has 135,000 employees and $110 billion in revenue. Yep. 27x the revenues and 100x the, I'm sorry, 27x the employee count and 100x the revenues. Yeah. Just keep that in mind. A lot of our CEOs, I keep telling them, revenue should go disproportionately <laughs> beyond the headcount. So just learn from this. What, what do you I think? tell that to my employees too, actually. <laughs> What do you think is the secret sauce? How did you guys, uh, how did you guys manage to, to stay on top over all these years? Kind of what's your high level view here? Well, I'm, you know, I think you talked about this a little bit, um, where to build something durable, you've got to start with a sense of mission. And so when Bill started Microsoft, he had a very, you know, at that time, it's, you know, it seems ludicrous now, but at that time, it was a very ambitious uh, sense of purpose, which was to put computing on every desk in every home. You know, and this was the time when the CEO of DAC a few years ago had said the world probably needs only five computers or six computers. And so we're built to have that audacious goal. I mean, that sense of purpose, and Bill himself, I mean, we were fortunate to have him. I've not seen anybody. I mean, he still is helpful, and I put that in quotes in, you know, from his perspective on architecture and scenarios, but I've never seen somebody who's taken such a long-term view of what the potential of technology is. And then, you know, Steve really came in and helped us scale worldwide. He came in and put in the business structures, the subsidiary structures, the business model, and really how engineering people, support, sales, marketing would work together cohesively. Scaling is, you know, at that, you know, even at that time, well, there, was no blue, there was no blueprint, there was no book written on how do you take a technology company to worldwide scale. So Steve did a bunch of that. And then, you know, in our 40-year history, our third CEO, Satya, came on board now almost five years ago. And at that time, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't this burning platform at Microsoft. There wasn't a sense of crisis. But there was, you know, a sense of we had become middle-aged and, you know, we had to rediscover our purpose. You know, we were healthy from a financial perspective. We were doing interesting work. And when Satya came on board, he spent you know, time with the leadership team really making sure that we were honest about what we're we uniquely bringing to the industry and to society. And so what was our sense of mission? And so it's, you know, it seems obvious, but we spent a lot of time when he came on board and recommitting to our long-term mission and aligning to that. And that was to empower people and organizations to be their best, to do their best work, you know, to realize their full potential. So I think this seeking of a mission and having a commitment to, you know, I can go on the, our journey over the last five years, but it's been remarkable to see the kind of cultural transformation that Satya has been able to bring to the table. But it always starts with being really grounded in your mission and your values. And you know, what you do today may not hold, and you know, our industry is incredibly dynamic. Yeah, competition's gonna change, market expectations gonna change, uh, trends are gonna blindside you. And so to come up with you know, some sense of reflection every once in a while to see if your values and your mission still hold, I think is the fundamental tenet. It's great. Yeah. What about you personally? Well, how is your role evolved over the years, kind of what was your role in the growth of the company? Yeah, um, you know, I started out as a developer and life was fairly simple. Uh, you know, I, when I first became a developer, I came out of school and I got to write some code. And I said, well, I can't believe they're actually trusting me to ship stuff, <laughs> uh, you know. And sure enough, you know, I had some hideous bugs that went out in the first release and I was incredibly uh, down on myself. And uh, but it was, it was just fantastic to come into Microsoft and we were 5,000 uh, person employee. Bill used to still 
you know, walk the hallways and he used to come in and ask for product discussions and were very invigorating. And then over the years I became a manager, I was conflicted if I wanted to be a manager, went back to being a developer, flip-flopped a few times, but mostly stayed around office and productivity. And then uh, more recently had the devices and the Windows pieces and management and security also move over. And our, the way our company is set up right now is uh, I've got what's called experiences and devices. And so think about Microsoft having two fundamental business models. One is around enabling users to uh, do their best work, whether it be product video business process. So we have Office 365 or Dynamics 365. Mm -hmm. And then we have an infrastructure business model, a consumption business model, a per user business model and a consumption. That is Microsoft Azure. Mm -hmm. And so my peers, Scott Guthrie, runs Azure, and I've got James Phillips on Dynamics 365, and I run Microsoft 365. But it's really about innovating all the way from silicon into the experience, into the cloud for AI, value back, and serving the person. You know, when computing's ubiquitous, how do we actually allow every person to do their best work? So that's my job today. You know, 10 years ago, I would say the defining moment for us was 10 years ago. You were asking me, Dharmesh, uh, when the cloud came on us and this cross-platform, you know, we were very much an on-premises company. We used to ship software to our customers in a waterfall model every two and a half years. And it was about enterprise servers and it was about desktop software. And the transition to a multi-device, cross-platform and cloud-delivered that was, you know, 10 years ago, it was not clear that was the right bet for us to make. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of confusion in the company. Is this what customers want? And as recently as six years ago, when I was talking to about 100 large company CIOs, as for a show of hands as to how many wanted to move to the cloud, it was probably a third that said we are ready to move to the cloud. But a year later, it was two thirds. So the fact that 10 years ago, Steve and Satya at that time, you know, we made the commitment to go all in into the cloud, and it was in the early days of making that happen with Office 365. That was a non-trivial call in terms of business model, architecture, yeah. engineering, culture. It was, uh, it was definitely a journey. Yeah, I mean, you can probably, you can't relate to them, but plenty of companies who have a current business on-prem have resisted the temptation to move to the cloud, going as far as saying, this thing isn't real. And Microsoft kind of took the exact opposite approach, saying, hey, we have this massive server business which you know, supports data centers, but we accept the fact that cloud is real and we go all in. So kind of how, what were the pros and cons of that decision? Because it's not an obvious decision. You've got a multi-billion dollar business to defend, and yet you have to go support a new line of business that could cannibalize the existing business. Many of our kind of companies that are at the IPO stage or a year away from that are constantly thinking about some of those pivots in the product, or how do you transform your business model uh, you know, from what has been working the last several years to what the future holds. So w walk us through that. No, you're right, Dharmesh. I think that is the hardest thing. In fact, I would think our biggest successes in 40 years in Microsoft is when we have, we have unshackled ourselves from the business models that made us successful. And our biggest failures have been when we were unable to go do that. Mm. And you know, it, it, it's not a trivial thing. We can all be courageous in theoretical concepts. You know, it's hey, of course, you know, if it's somebody else's business, we can look at it with some distance and say, of course, they should embrace it, disrupt themselves. But you know, this is uh, you know, you don't you don't get to walk away from your current customers, your current businesses, your current commitments. So you have to perform while transforming, and that's where you know, like. You know, as somebody said, you know, so any fool can optimize for the long term or the short term. The question is, are you able to do both? Hmm. And that is where, uh, you know, you first start with clarity of, is this the right thing to do long term? And with the cloud and the devices, you know, that we, we, we had the insight that the cloud wasn't about economies of scale. It was about economies of skills. Our customers were just unable to keep up with the software that we used to give them every two and a half, three years. Mm. And so when that realization, the fact that we were off trying to create what we thought was customer value, but they were unable to materialize that on their own, was what gave us the blinding clarity, look, this is it. This is the North Star. This is where we must go. So once you have that conviction, then 
you got to work the business model, overlap the old and the new. But the hardest thing, I think, Dharmesh, was the culture change. So because anytime you've had success, whether you get to IPO or early stage or you know, post-IPO, if you have success, what does that mean? You have success because you have a business model that reinforces the way you work. It, the way you work is reinforced by the architecture, the engineering, and the processes that you have, and the checks and balances. And so when you want to disrupt that, you're walking away from what is the culture, the culture that made you successful. And that is the, that realization that you know, there is no shortcut to this. Intellectually, people can understand, oh, I've got to get onto a new way of working, a new business model. But you cannot get there without a commitment to really rethinking your mission, your values, and your culture. Uh -huh. And so that, I think, is the biggest thing that Satya did when he came on board was we had a big reboot. And the cloud, you know, the journey 10 years ago that we started in the cloud, the culture change was kind of happening unbeknownst to us. We were not really confronting it head on. And sat under Satya's watch, we just accelerated that and committed to it. Got it. I mean, you make it sound pretty easy. We decided there's a culture change needed. Let's go do it. Well, I'm I mean, sure the gray hair should tell you that it was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Culture change is really, really Absolutely. hard. Absolutely. I mean, I cannot, it's just, see, the thing I tell people is, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive, but culture and process are two sides of the same coin. Because, you know, you know what's culture? Every, one, all of us can read great books. We intellectually get stuff. And it's just a set of words until you institutionalize it in the way you behave. If you're five people, culture can just be words, and words written on a whiteboard and informal conversations over lunch. But if you're 50 people, you're 100 people, or 1,000, 2,000, 20,000, you've got to institutionalize culture in the processes that you value. For example, if I go and tell my engineering team, hey, customer, you've got to really obsess about customer success. But then when they sit with me, if the metrics that I look at is not consistent with that, if the metrics I look at is, hey, what's the new innovation? How many features have you released? That is not, that is not the culture that I'm helping create. My words are not consistent with my culture. So you've got to really think about every process from the leadership town, couple of levels, and is it reinforcing what you think is the culture you need to go build to deliver the success that you need to you know, that you aspire to. So it wasn't easy. It's a real rethink of the way you work. Got it. And since nobody's tweeting over here, could you kind of share some of the boardroom discussions? Because, you know, again, you have a well-functioning company. The board's happy with the performance. Things are going great. New CEO comes and decides to disrupt a bunch of things. Again, it can't be that easy from a boardroom level discussion perspective. Any color you can share on that? I mean, it's the usual things you would suspect is, you know, how do you, how much, well, the considerations are always is how much risk can you take with your current business? How much, you know, can you, what is the rate of change that's acceptable from fisc, you know, fiscal uh, accountability, but also customer consumption? See, the, one of the things that we, um, are, you, can, you can embrace a new trend and you can overshoot your customer. Uh, one of the things I tell my team is, you know, outside of the computer industry, if you use the word legacy, it's got a very positive connotation. If somebody comes and talks to you about legacy, you know, it means something positive. But in our industry, oh my God, legacy is like, you know, <laughs> it's like a boat anchor. And so the hard discussions were, how do you take your business model and your customers of today forward in the journey? This slash and burn thing that we intend to have in tech, you know, we got it all figured out. AI is a new thing. The old thing is completely irrelevant. That just leaves a wake. You know, you can't take existing mission critical business process or commitments. You know, how many of you like your, you know, you got a big uh, uh, meeting coming up. How many of you like to see a device reboot because some new innovative thing came down? Probably not. And so you magnify that 100 times. So the biggest, hardest discussions was, you know, just second guessing, are we going too fast? Are we not going fast enough? Yeah. Are we, and, you know, customers will actually tell you, and there's this interesting thing that I had with a set of, you know, we have, I have a formal advisory council of a set of customers. And I was meeting with them four years ago. Super interesting. So, 
It started out by them telling me, you're not innovating fast enough. You know, you're just not doing, you know, new capabilities aren't coming fast enough. Um, you know, we take a look at the consumer world, things are evolving so fast in the business, we really want things that fast. You know, I take all the feedback, I point out some of the work we've done. So after that set of discussions got over, somebody teed up the next one where, honestly, this is the next five minutes was, you're moving too fast. You're moving too fast, I can't keep up. You know, I've got commitments to uh, deliver on. Why are you driving so much change on us? And they actually, you know, they really wanted it both. They wanted innovation, but on their terms. They don't want innovation jammed into them just because we felt this was the North Star. So the hardest board conversations was how much fiscal risk, how much customer risk, and how do you stay true to what you believe is the long term? Yeah. And now, a lot of the changes you talk about seem to be driven by the market conditions. Like you said, one third of the market going to the cloud, two third the year after. There's also a big driver behind it, which is the leadership change. Satya coming to the stage, taking reins from Steve Ballmer. If you look at the management style across the three leaders the company's had for the last 40 years, what comes to mind? Like, what, is the, are, what are the striking differences uh, between the leadership styles? Well, I, you know, I got to be with Bill much more in the product or architecture discussion mm -hmm. context. So my feet, like, like I was saying earlier, just in, yeah, he is relentlessly forward-looking. I mean, the short-term considerations are not important to him. It's, a, it's the blinding clarity of actually building and doing something materially valuable to humanity. Mm -hmm. That is his biggest consideration. And that's just great to be around somebody who's got that perspective. With Steve, I learned a lot about scaling. Yeah, you know, real thoughtfulness on the processes to follow mm -hmm. and clarity of business model. And the thing I learned from him was, you know, if you, at the leadership level, if there is some lack of clarity by the time it cascades to your customers, to your, you know, to your sellers, to your employees, it gets magnified multifold. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really important to have clarity at the leadership level. But I've worked directly for Satya, and he's just amazing. Um, you know, I know he's not listening, and so this is not to <laughs> work in his good books, but it's amazing. I mean, um, the thing that I admire about him is he's so outside in, um, where he's, he's, of course, super good technically. Um, but he's always wanting to learn. He wants to learn about your point of view. He wants to learn when he's with a customer meeting. He really wants to immerse himself, de himself deeply into understanding what is the customer saying, not at a superficial level, but deeply. Why are they saying what they are saying? How do they operate? What is their profit? Where do their profits come from? What's their biggest pain point? And so he's probably the best listener that I have seen. Not just when, I mean, he deeply internalizes that and he synthesizes all of that stuff. He's super well read, so he has his own perspective. And so he keeps telling us, you know, hey, don't be know it all, be learn it all. And he actually exudes that every single day. The other interesting thing is like people ask me, uh, how are you one on ones with Satya? And I tell them, actually, I don't meet him one on one that often, maybe once every three to six months, and that really surprises them. Because the way we work at Microsoft as a senior leadership team, he actually, we try to get together every Friday as a leadership team. He does not want to meet with me and hear me complain about my peers or what's not going well. He wants to have that discussion in a forum with all my peers. Hmm. So we are all invested in each other's issues, in each other's successes, and their conversations are transparent and open. If I have an issue, with one of my peers about some dependency or some expectation, that's all done in a very open forum. So this culture of being a really good listener, drawing that in, and you know what, being a good listener is really also about a commitment to diversity. Because you cannot be a good listener if you do not want to invite explicitly diverse perspectives into the discussion. And by diversity, I mean it could be gender diversity, it could be diversity, you know, like. I think that some of the best growth I have seen in my team, and it hasn't been easy, is when I had actually, you know, we bought four companies here two years ago, five companies and two in Seattle area. And many of those CEOs, I invited them into my leadership team. 
And their perspectives were so uniquely different from people. And you know, the people at Microsoft, my leaders at Microsoft, I mean, we, I'm accountable indirectly or indirectly for about 70 billion in revenue. These people have massive, massive scaled businesses. And you bring these outside in CEOs, you bring people who've done scaled businesses, you try and meld them all together. It was not easy. Very different microcultures, very different sensibility. But I think we are much, much, much stronger because we got that kind of diversity wing and then Satya stripes for that every single day. Got it, great. You, know, you talk about customer driven culture, being yeah. a good listener, and obviously Microsoft has done exceptionally well doing that, uh, especially the last five years. There's this other tiny company you might have heard about in Seattle called Amazon, yep. that also has a customer centric mentality. I'm sure you guys talk about this in your leadership team all the time. Kind of how do you compare or contrast Microsoft's approach to the market, to customers, to transformation? perhaps relative to, to Amazon, or uh, I guess that's more relevant in the, the cloud space. But yeah, just talk about that. I think Amazon's an awesome company in terms of, I think Jeff and his leadership team, they're very, very committed to being about the customers. And I think a lot of their success comes from that. And look, I mean, we, we aspire to learn from whoever we can, and um, you know, I, I respect what they do. Now, our customer base is slightly different, our product mix is slightly mm -hmm. different, and so what customer obsession means to us is probably different than what it means to Amazon. But um, yeah, I mean, I only have good things to say about their sensibility to the customer, except the one thing I would say, I can't resist it a little bit. You know, our <laughs> <laughs> that's the moment everybody's waiting for, okay. Look, you know, our mission statement is about our customer success. It's very clarifying. We don't compete with our customers. And so, you know, right. if a bank takes a bet on Microsoft, we are not going to look to be a bank. If a retailer looks to take mm -hmm. a bet on Microsoft, we're not looking to be a retailer. So our customer obsession really lines up to our mission, all the way to our mission statement. It isn't just an execution thing to make our products better, to serve them better month to month, a quarter to quarter, but it's like we want to be ground in their success. Mm -hmm. right. That is our mission statement. Good point. You know, I want to go back, Rajesh, to one of the points you mentioned earlier, which relates to, say, 99% of the people here, which is scaling in the short term and the long term. It's easy to do one or the other, but how do you do both, right? Any, any advice for the CEOs, founders in the audience? Kind of how do you make your short-term goals without losing sight of the, the long term as you're scaling a your business? Yeah, I mean, look, there was, I, I had the good fortune to be... Um, in some kind of training session many, many uh, years ago. Um, I think it was Harvard Business School. It was this really, I forget the name of the professor, but he had a very succinct framework that uh, you know, I've kept with me. If you're an organization leader, here are the things you gotta worry about. You know, all of us know this intuitively, but it was a very good crystallization. You gotta start with values and mission, job number one. Be clear about what your values and mission are. Number two is culture. And culture and process, you know, this is my overlay on it, where it's like if you want to be sustainable on your culture, you got to be thoughtful about the processes you're instituting in your organization because that reinforces a culture. Whether you like it or not, that is what defines a culture. The third thing is strategy and resource allocation. They are the same, actually, because, you know, strategy, again, is words. If you really want to see an organization strategy or your own strategy, take a look at where your resources are. Because resource allocation is the statement you make about strategy as a leader. So you take those three things. Now, whether you're scaling, whether you're static, whether, you know, those things are basically how you've got to always, am I doing, you know, am I really thinking about this holistically? Mm -hmm. Then when you're scaling, what tends to happen is um, you're going to have to rethink some of these. Sometimes your mission statements change, like Microsoft's mission statement. The world evolved. You know, our first mission got achieved faster than we thought, perhaps. And so we really, it took Satya to come in and say, it's time for us. So you'll have to rethink at every scale and inflection point. You know, are the values that you bet on are still the values? Do they you need to refine them? Is your mission statement still holding true? The culture that got you to a certain point, is that the culture that gets you to the next level of scale? And then again, your resources allocation. Now, what will happen is, it will sneak up on you. Scale, sometimes it's a discontinuity. Sometimes it sneaks up on you gradually. And I was telling Dharmesh, you know, so at Microsoft, um, you know, I had 
at one point I had about five, 6,000 employees and there was some change and I, my team doubled in size and I was working incredibly hard with the new set of accountability. And my dad was visiting me then. And you know, I don't know about your relationship with your parent. You know, my dad and I, good relationship generally, except when he gives me advice. <laughs> so, so anyway, I come in working really hard, nine, 10 in the night, I come home and dad is sitting there with a drink in his hand and he looks at me and says, yeah, I'm doing, a, you're not really doing a great job. And that was very <laughs> irritating, you know, to be perfectly honest, I've been working incredibly hard with all this change. But what he told me was, if you're working this hard, then surely there are things you're not doing that only you can uniquely do. And of course, you know, I dismissed what he had to say, except next morning as we were reflecting on it. And he was right. What had happened was, because my job had changed, I had forgotten to take a step back to think, you know, you know, of course, every once in a while you'll have 30 days, two months, three months where you have to go and work incredibly hard. But if you're working extraordinarily hard for a long period of time, that's a signal that you need to go rethink. Is the culture, the delegation, the processes, the resource allocation, do you have the right people in the right jobs? That's a good warning signal that you know, whatever was working isn't working anymore and you have to go back to the framework and think where are the friction points? And that was a good reminder for me. So I think it's just going back to the same framework and you'll have to rework the framework given the new context. Got it. What about people? Talk about that. I mean, this is one of the hardest things that many of our company CEOs, I personally have dealt with it. Folks who are amazing team members were once get at the company for a variety of reasons, just don't transition. And you know, many leaders are too late to make the hard decision. So I'd love to kind of get your philosophy on managing talent, you know, managing people, making the tough decisions uh, at the scaling stage and the transformation stage. Or even during run state. You know, I think, um, and to overly generalize, let me just say, I think people tend to be fall in one or two camps as managers. Some of us give up on people too quickly. And most of us don't make the hard calls quick enough. Mm. And so you've got to be, in, you know, neither is right or wrong. I mean, you just have to be aware of how you operate. You know, if you tend to be in the camp that you don't give up on people fast enough and you hold on to them because you want to keep giving them, you want to avoid the tough call, you, they've done amazing work in the past, you don't want to make the hard call. Now, you've got to be aware that's how you tend to operate. So that's the first thing I would say is, look, you've got to know who you are. That will inform you when you see performance issues. Hey, are you falling back to your habit or uh, not? But as a leader, I do think, um, and let me just share with you how I like to operate myself, which is, you know, I think business is hard enough, serving customers at scale is hard enough, that the single most important thing that I value is transparency and bias for action balanced with making sure that I actually do listen and surround myself with diversity. I get worried when we make big decisions and there is group, you know, everybody seems to be in agreement. Everybody has the same perspective. And that happens more often than you might think because, mm -hmm. you know, if a group's performing really well, you've had success. But if you're always thinking the same way, you're going to get blindsided. And so making sure that you surround yourself with people who, it's not important to have, you can't have a leadership team with super well-rounded individuals all the time. I don't think that's worthwhile. You need people who are amazing architects, or you need people who are amazing managers, people who really understand one perspective, mm -hmm. people who are collaborative, people who are biased for action. That balance is good. As a leader, if you are still, if you're, if you are able to not get paralyzed, if you're able to make, have a bias for action, be clear, be transparent, you, you're best served by having that kind of diverse perspectives in. Gotcha. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing because what will happen is three months later, you'll be a well-oiled machine with your leadership team, things are going great, and then you have to come up for air and say, how do I get more perspectives here? Gotcha. So just put it all in perspective, yeah. I want to leave some time for Q&A from the audience as well. If you reflect back at your remarkable career at, at Microsoft, what are one or, perhaps one or two of the best decisions that you think the company made or you personally made that is contributing to where Microsoft is today? 
I think getting onto the cloud early and then being courageous enough that, look, you know, when, when I started the Office 365 work, the conventional wisdom in the industry and even some at Microsoft was we should do it over. You know, our legacy products couldn't be, you know, we couldn't teach old docs to do new tricks, go cross platform, get into the cloud. And so let's start over. And that's so exciting, you know, as sometimes you're a product person, and, you know, to, to do it over and you do it right. But I think we did it right, which is if we had done it over, why would I have, you know, so the thing that we did was we, trans, we transformed while performing with our existing customers with existing capabilities. Mm. What I mean by that is we moved our legacy forward. Even as we had clarity on moving to the cloud, we didn't abandon our legacy and be who we are not. We built on who we were and took our existing customers forward. And it took incredible amount of work. We didn't take the easy path of going and saying, let's just start over. And so I feel that is why Office 365 today is the largest SaaS service by you know, at least 2x or 3x compared to anything else on the planet. Is because we took our existing assets, our existing customers, and the enterprise trust while giving them the benefits of the cloud. Now, we, I did lots of things wrong, too. But that but was what the that, one that was thing that I question. feel good, too. <laughs> so if you look back, what would you have done differently? Um, at a personal level, I mean, at the company level, of course, we've made mistakes on mobile, uh, most notably. At a personal level, I would say, you know, actually, it was 15 years ago, I think, that we had our first so Microsoft, you know, this wisdom was we jumped on cloud 10 years early, but actually 15 years ago, Bill had pushed a bunch of us to go start this project called NetDocs. NetDocs was the first, first attempt to take productivity into the cloud. Now, that was a day of 14, four modems, 28, eight modems, so we were probably a little ahead of our time. And so I think the mistake in reflection, I think the engineering that we had done, and we never took it out to market because it just wasn't a good market fit, which was the mistake. We were too tech-led then. We were not enough, we were not ground enough in our customer context. So my biggest mistake would have also been getting onto the cloud too early, and I think the thing that we did right was to go all into the cloud, but on our customers' terms, not on our terms. Got it, got it. One last yeah. question from Maya, and I know Alicia is yeah. getting nervous, but any, Closing thoughts. For the CEOs in the audience, they're, they're fighting the battle every day. You know, they got teams to manage, the market conditions are changing, there's competition. Um, what are one or two you know, pieces of advice you'd have for them to be long-term greedy, you know, building lasting value in their companies? What would you leave them with? I would just go back to the same thing. I mean, there's no e the work you do is amazing. I mean, I have huge respect for what you guys do. I mean, to create new Something new is always incredibly hard. And we've tried to do this inside of Microsoft, and you know, it's much harder to do it inside of an established uh, company. So what you guys do every single day, you know, trying to create new scenarios, new capabilities for customers is incredibly hard. My only advice to you would be um, just be explicit about the framework you know, it's too, too often it is, it's, uh, you feel it's all understood by your employees or by your stakeholders about your mission, you know, what culture do you want to go create. Find time from the frenetic pace that all of you must be through to go reflect on, hey, are your resources allocated in the right place? Do you have the right people? Uh, you know, are you doing a good job actually mentoring them? Are you getting mentored? And if you don't find time to reflect on the structural foundations, then it's going to sneak up on you in ways that you know you can't fully control. That's great. Yeah, Alicia, you want to open up the questions for the audience? Yeah, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll bring around mics if you've got a question. Come over there. Hi, I'm Travis Katz from Skyscanner. Um, so fascinating talk. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'd, I'd love to have you reflect a little bit on, so Microsoft's obviously had an incredibly long and successful history, but there were some famous misses, you know, particularly mobile, as you mentioned. Mobile and search, I guess, are the, are the two big ones. I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, reflecting back on 
what was going on inside of Microsoft and were there things that you had done in terms of organization or culture or things that caused Microsoft not to go after those, those opportunities or not, not to catch those early enough? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, there are so many uh, altitudes at which I could answer the question. I would say that probably the highest altitude, my, and this is my reflection of the happenings, uh, is we were probably too afraid to walk away from our existing business model. There was lots of other things that we could have done better. But our existing business model of OEM royalty for Windows was just too hard for us to walk away from when the landscape had fundamentally changed. I think it starts there. And sure, we could have done some things better, faster, but it starts there. And I do think that is the place where most of the, and I don't think that's unique to us, most of the companies, that's what happens. Because even if you see a disruption come in and you know, hey, I better rethink my business model, it's one thing to acknowledge it, it's another thing to institutionalize it and to take the risk and to actually take the risk of ripping out your existing culture, reinforcing a new one, putting the right people in roles, taking the risk of your existing business models. That is hard to go do. I, yeah, it's a good question. So it's, the cloud is an example where we said, all right, you know, we will go make this change. It, it has to be a commitment from the top. Now, one of the things that we do at the board level or the senior leadership team meeting, whenever we have a discussion of should we, should we not, we explicitly ask ourselves, are we, are we backing off because of a business, an assumption of an existing business model getting in our way? That is an explicit check mark for us to just ask ourselves and to liberate ourselves from saying we shouldn't stop because of a business model constraint. So just being aware, having made the mistake, and then correcting that, and then always acknowledging is probably the only thing we could do. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You, uh, sorry. Hi, I'm Bill from uh, Braze. You mentioned a couple examples, uh, or I guess you mentioned just kind of the trend of acquiring companies and then bringing in new direct reports and the tension that that can create both culturally as well as amongst you know, the, the um, leaders in that. What are some of the ingredients where that's a really positive change? Uh, or like, what have you done to kind of encourage that those new people that are coming in as your direct reports or kind of those new cultures or product spaces or approaches or what have you have been really beneficial and positive? Yeah, I mean, see the benefits are, it's not hard to see the benefits because the perspective that you people have is so ground in, you know, in, without the weight of 25 years of Microsoft evolution. So when we, it's, it's just the customer insights people have. You know, there was this uh, company we bought, uh, Mobile Data Labs, you know, where Chuck Dietrich was the CEO. The way they did product development was a unique blend of analytics and design and engineers, you know, rapidly iterating, was not the way we had internalized it. So it, the benefits are obvious, but then how do you take those benefits and scale it out to three orders of magnitude more employees who are actually by you know, any, any measure are pretty successful in what they are doing their way with millions and millions of customers and billions in revenue. So how do you take those elements and how do you scale it out? Now, there's a little bit of trick in it. We know we, if I, if I have um, an acquisition and I burden them with being the culture uh, stalwarts for the larger organization, I mean, well, you know, that's pretty exhausting. So how do I draw on their insights, set up the processes? So this is where I had to go back to process. So Chuck's insights there on how he did engineering, I spent a lot of time thinking, I, can just, I can't just go throw Chuck at 20,000 employees. You know, he won't even know how to navigate, and even if he does, you know, every single day, those 20,000 employees are gonna be back into doing the things the way they've been doing because their existing processes are set up that way. So I had to go change the way our engineering and product processes were to incorporate some of what Chuck's insights were and made Chuck the leader for some of those processes. Yeah, so that's, a, I guess, the interdisciplinary growth team approach. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting example because it goes directly to hiring and org charts and such too. So like, have you modeled things that Chuck was doing at 
Mile IQ or, or elsewhere over to the office product group and yes. uh, then feed into hiring as well? And Absolutely. How, kind of how prescriptive are you about that? Um, you've got to be smart about, you know, you can't, what Chuck did in Mile IQ worked for a team of 20. It's not necessarily going to work for a team. And this was all end user going to a mobile app store, downloading an app and iterating on the app, giving it feedback. Not the same sensibility as a big bank CIO saying, hey, you know, I need the following risk management capabilities before I move my mission critical data into your cloud. So you've got to be really thoughtful about where do you mandate, how do you mandate, and you can't go and say, you know, we'll try and take that insight and blast it across. You've got to pick high value places where that insight's a good fit. This is what as leaders we have to do. It's easy for us, you know, I think too much of us, we like the strategy, uh, we like the insights, and then we just uh, assume by putting to the two together it will happen. You have to go one level below into the culture and the process design to make it stick. And this is not just in terms of uh, you know, an acquisition coming in and how do you scale the impact. Any change we want to make to our organizations as leaders, we and only we are set up to go and do the process change or the culture change that makes it stick. Otherwise, the change is just it's like a flat stone skimming on the surface of the water. It's just going to skim right off. And you've got to figure out a way to actually institutionalize it. Great. Okay. Hi, my name is Vinod. I'm the CEO co-founder at CloudCherry. Um, you've had the benefit of seeing three great CEOs. You're a leader at scale. Uh, one of the things a leader does is work daily with their teams to make them better, appraise them, identify areas of improvement, really work on making them better every day. Who does that for the CEO? I know boards don't do that on a daily basis, right? For the CEO, hmm. like the CEOs that you saw, how did they improve themselves? Who ran, quote unquote, their appraisal? Who told them every day what you're supposed to get better at? How did they get better? That's ah. something I struggle with on a daily basis. That's a good Long question. Up. So I think the process that we have, at least let me share with you, uh, the process uh, that Satya follows. So Satya's check-in with the board, his performance is preceded, it's annual, but I think there's feedback every six months, but it's annual. So that's preceded by the board members reaching out to me or his other direct reports for feedback. And then our head of HR also solicits feedback more extensively beyond just the uh, Satya's direct reports. Then there's other things that go into it. Of course, the business performance goes in. Then there is employee poll results that also factor in. And the employee poll results are, you know, they have a cultural element, a diversity element, you know, empowerment element, a lot of those things. And so some total of these is the 360 feedback that goes into Satya. And so my performance evaluation is done in a very similar way, where there is feedback invited from my direct reports on any other senior leader, uh, including my peers. And then, of course, there is the, you know, the measurable metrics that you have. Then there is the, the feedback from the, and the rest of the stakeholders, the employee population through the poll, and there's a triangulation, all of that. But I think in the end of the day, though, it is, it is, I think, I see in him a commitment to improve. So when he sits with us in the senior leadership team, he's actually very receptive to feedback. So I feel that the SLT discussions, senior leadership team discussions we have, mm. is very open in terms of if I push back on him, some of his ideas and say, now this is misguided. He's actually really invested in understanding what? And he may not agree with me and he's the boss, but I do feel that he's actually taking feedback on an ongoing basis. Then the other thing that he does also is, you know, we've got a Teams channel or a group where uh, it's a very open forum for senior leaders to provide feedback on a bunch of different issues. But you see your job is going to be a bit lonely, and so you're going to have to lean in and seek feedback. Otherwise, it's very easy to be in a bit of a bubble and, uh, you know, and there are not very many people are going to have courage to walk up to you and give you negative feedback. So when I get positive feedback in the aftermath of an event, you know, I always color it with the fact that you know, people with negative feedback are probably not going to walk up to me and say, hey, you did a pretty crappy job there. Yeah. So. I say that to my CEOs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Makes them better, is what they tell me. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Do we have time for one more question, Alicia? Or? I think, or one more. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, hi there. Hi. 
My name is Greg Smear and I'm the CEO of Interana. And I, I feel like probably a number of us have had the experience of being able to work with uh, the new Microsoft, especially the Azure team, uh, where the new Microsoft is able to partner very effectively with uh, independent software firms. And I'd just love to get a little bit of guidance from you on the kind of things that you see that software firms do um, and how best to prepare to work effectively with the you know, 5,000 plus Microsoft Enterprise uh, sales force. You're asking the hard questions. <laughs> no, but uh, I think, you know, if you're as a partner, look, I mean, we have Microsoft, uh, we have earned our customers' trust uh, in terms of being a good enterprise partner. Enterprise business is a messy business. You've got to stay with your partners. There's nothing pristine about any enterprise infrastructure. And we've stayed with our customer. We grind it out. We work with them on their terms to modernize them. So we've earned their trust. With Azure, with M365, Microsoft 365, we have a, long, a big enterprise presence. We want to partner. You know, we are not, not we, with Satya, the, one of the things that is really, really clear is we want to be a company that partners well. You know, uh, and so we want to partner well. So we are well intentioned. Now the question is, are we executing well on these things? And I would invite you guys, I mean, if you want to go to the enterprise customers with us, developer.microsoft.com should be a great starting point, whether it be Dynamics or Azure or Office 365. Now, you can actually choose to integrate with Dynamics and Microsoft 365 without being on Azure. But know that if you want our enterprise salespeople to be incented to sell your solutions to our enterprise customers, then being on Azure helps them retire their quota, and so they will, you know, that works much more naturally. But uh, you know, give us feedback if you feel we are hard to do business with because there's some friction in commerce or we're not executing well. I'm all ears because our. You know, we are not going to be able to deliver all the value that our customers seek from us. So we are. We want to have the infrastructure cloud, we want to have the productivity cloud and the business process cloud with Dynamics, but we am looking to be great partners to you all if you feel that the enterprise is where you want to go to. Awesome. Great. Okay. Well, Rajesh, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day well, thank and you sharing for inviting your perspectives yeah. with everybody. Thank you, it's thank you very much. I think Thanks, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you